Um, so first of all, uh, uh, thanks to the organizers for this uh, wonderful conference. And I'll try to speak not so fast, but stop me if I if I run. Okay. So um, from the beginning of the research of the Geniza to the present, scholars have focused on the period from the 10th to the 13th century. The discovery of letters from such prominent figures as Rachel Gaon, Maimonides, Yuda Levi, Ephraim and Shamaria, or, or even uh, you know, the, the great uh, traders as Abraham Ben Yidu, um, the, um, it uh, excited both the academic world and the public. The term Geniza became synonymous with that period. Goethein, for example, uh, you, you see, yeah? Um, mentioned uh, the documents of the Cairo Geniza and explained, here, middle class people of the 10th through the 13th century have left their letters, court records, etc. Goitain and other Geniza scholars used the term the Cairo Geniza period, referring only to the Fatimid and Ayubid period, here for example, Fata Geniza period. But Goitain was, of course, aware to the, of the existence of later documents in the Geniza collections. Indeed, every researcher, uh, every researcher who opens a volume of Geniza documents, Cambridge, Oxford, Paris, all of them known, um, can notice this fact within 10 minutes, maybe. Boyden mentioned such documents on some occasions. In his introduction to Mediterranean society, he mentioned uh, get from 1879 from Mumbai, for example. And also, um, he published by himself uh, here, for example, a folk tale from the 17th century, Kisat el Masri wal Rifi, the story on, uh, of the townsmen and the filach. In order to differentiate the Geniza of the 10th to the 13th centuries from the other periods documented in the Geniza, researchers used the terms Classic Geniza and late Geniza. Um, I hope I will criticize the, 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 the term classic Geniza in different occasions. Uh, today I want to speak about the term late Geniza. The term late Geniza covers a period of approximately 650 years from the middle of the 13th century to the end of the 19th century. So I want to ask if the term useful um, culture, language, demographics, family life, almost everything changed over such a long period. Think, for example, of theoretical Bible researchers um, who would call the corpus of sources of the period from the foundation of the Second Temple to the reduction of the Mishnah, the late sources. Uh, a period which includes the Apocrypha, Quran literature, the New Testament, Josephus, Philo, Mishnah, and Tosefta. Yes the late sources. There is no meaning to such a term. The term late Geniza is equivalent, in my eyes, to the via negativa of Maimonides and other scholars. We cannot say anything about God. We can only say that he, what, he, uh, what he is, isn't. He does not have human characteristics. In the same way, we cannot say anything about the huge corpus of documents. We only say that they are late, i.e. they are not from the classic Geniza. That's all. Let's look, for example, at three Ktubot from the late, what we call, late Geniza. The first one on the right is the Ketubah of Elazar ben Yeshua, who remarried his divorced wife, Shams, daughter of Mordechai, in December 1310. The second at the top is the Ketubah of an anonymous group, a groom, who married his wife, Rachel, in December 1566. And the third on the left, uh, is the, is the Cuba of Rafael Tortos and his wife Esther, daughter of Eliyahu Ruben, who is known, I no, don't say it here, uh, with a very funny, I found it funny nickname, Tantan, which was written in September 1813. A surface comparison of the Kubot reveals the changes that occurred in Jewish society through the century. The mention of the Nagi in the beginning of the document disappeared after the abolishment of the Nagi Day in 1517. Another item that disappeared is, of, of course, Minyan Shtabot, the Seleucid era. Um, another change was maybe more important um, was the place where these 
both were written. The Ketubah from the 14th century was still written in Ustad, while the later, uh, later Ketubah were written in the Kahirah's Mukhalif Ustad. The migration of Jews from Ustad to Cairo continued throughout the Mamluk period. The Jewish population began to, to concentrate uh, in the new city, Cairo. There is some evidence of Jewish presence in, in Ustad throughout the 16th century. For example, on the left, you can see a letter from the 15th or the 16th century. The writer, David Abul Kher, asks the Tetzavu here, uh, the Tetzavu, the Tetzavu, the Tetzavu, the Yeshana. Mitzrayim Yeshana, of course, is uh, the Hebrew version of Misra al um, A response of Rabbi uh, Yaakov Berar, one of the prominent sages of Egypt at the beginning of the 16th century, who settled later in, uh, in Safed, probably you know, uh, allowed the Jew who swore he would not live in Cairo, live in Ustad, which was still considered a different city than Cairo. But during the 16th century, or at the latest, the 17th century, the Jewish community of Ustad apparently disappeared. The Jews rescued the old synagogue through routine visits there, but it seemed that there was no permanent community in Ustad. Yosef Samkari, the famous historian who lived in Cairo in the 17th century, wrote, "Ve'atar egilin ayudim bechol Shabbat leShabbat la'alot ve'leraod et pnei Hashem bezot akneset shel Hashemim." The fact that the ten Jews were went every Saturday, every Shabbat, to the old city and prayed there in order to keep the Benazir synagogue uh, intact, indicates that there was probably no local minyan in the synagogue. The tradition of routine visits in the, uh, to the Benazir synagogue for prayer and study continued also in the following centuries. In a deed written in Cairo in 1818, Abraham Moseri, probably, maybe, one of the forefathers of Jacques Moseri, testified here that he received a certain amount of money from Rabbi Nisim El Ghazi, which belonged to the treasury of the special estate which was founded to support reading the learning of the Zohar in the Benazir synagogue. And here, um, Let's return now to our Ketubot. A comparison of these documents clearly indicates social changes among the Jews of Egypt. In the early Ketubah, from the 14th century, the bride accepted upon herself to the, uh, the counting of the seven clean days, Shiranikim, after her period and purification in a mikveh, or in the Nile. Uh, Amir spoke about that, about that uh, yesterday, uh, that we don't have e uh, evidence of, of mik mikvaot in Pustat, but the, the tradition was to go to the Nile, and it was the change in the 16th century. Uh, never mind. Uh, if she wasn't uh, abided by, by this commitment, she would lose her ktuba. This is not a condition probably know, which appeared in many Ketubot from that period, since the famous Takana of Maimonides, Maimonides court, on this matter in uh, 1187. In the other Ketubot we saw from the 16th and the 19th century, we don't find this condition. I think that the disappearance of the condition reflects the decline of the Karai community in Egypt during the Mamluk and Ottoman period. In the early Mamluk period, the Karai still posed a challenge for rabbinic leadership, and the rabbis were still afraid of Karaitic Kara influence on rabbinite women. This fear dissipated later, and there was therefore no need to mention the condition of the mikveh in Ktubot. Another condition that appears in the Ktubah from the 14th century is the prohibition on marrying another woman without the wife's approval. Yeah. Um, this, uh, this condition also uh, appears also in the in the late Kluba. But in the first Kluba here um, we see we, we saw an additional condition. The wife in the 14th century Kluba got the right to veto uh, the hiring of a female slave she did not like. This was a very common condition in many Ketubot, but in the Ketubah from 1813, this condition is missing. Can we learn from this that owing slaves in Jewish households in Egypt during the 19th century was not common? I'm not sure, but 
the difference between the documents here on this matter is clear and requires discussion. Another difference between the conditions of the Ktubot is instructive. The Ktubot from the 14th century includes the condition the wife had the right to work and earn her own money, but she, was, she then loses her right to receive clothes from her husband. This was a common condition in the Mamluk period and appeared in many Ktubot from this period. But during the Ottoman period, this condition disappeared, probably due to Sephardic influence. The late Ktuba includes a condition, let me know from nowadays Ktubot, Ma'aseya de Aloha Muqsuda Allah. In this Ktuba, the husband received the money that earned from his wife's work but must give her a budget for buying clothes. So the term the late Geniza, therefore, is too amorphous and needs to be replaced by more specific terms. Goitain, on some occasions, called the period of the 15th and 16th centuries the Sephardi Geniza, due to the large wave of Sephardi immigrants who arrived in the East during this period. But not only does this term deprive credit from Ashkenazi, Italian, and Maghribian Jews, who uh, also were active in the East in this period, it also does not help us with terminology for the other periods included under the title of the late Geniza. One option I want to share with you is to divide the chronology of the Geniza documents according to external characterization, i.e. according to the Muslim authority of the period. I mean, uh, early Geniza, the Fatimid and Ayyubid periods, the Mamluk period, the Ottoman period, and what I call the new era, I mean the period from the French invasion through Muhammad Ali and his dynasty uh, till, until the British occupation in uh, 1882. This is, in my, in my point of view, it's a um, different uh, period than the, the Ottoman period. Another option is to divide the documents according to internal characteristics, i.e. the Jewish leadership. The disadvantage of this uh, suggestion is the absence of central leadership throughout Jewish society in the Ottoman period. Now, I, I offer to, to, it's not accurate, but to divide it, you see, the Palestinian government, early Nagidate, Maimonidian, we, we know that Maimonides uh, was appointed as, as not Nagid, Raiz al Yahud in 1171, after that he had conflict over his position as Menachem Sasson and Mark Cohen showing in, their, uh, in details in their articles, and later, late night, but for the Ottoman period and, new, and what I call the, the 19th century, uh, it's not useful. Um, so, but, but these suggestions uh, of new periodization are not the main point here. So if, if you don't find it useful for your research, don't use them. Uh, the, the, ma the main point here is the abandonment of the not sufficiently specific title, the late Geniza, in favor of more accurate terms, such the Geniza of the 14th century, the Geniza of the 17th century, the Geniza of the 19th century, more accurate. In the short amount of time left uh, for me, I want to briefly describe the maybe some characteristics of the documents of the Ottoman period i.e. the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries. The main characteristic is perhaps the ling linguistic one. In this period, additional languages appeared in the Geniza, alongside Hebrew and Judeo Arabic. The most prominent among the new languages is Ladino. There are many sermons, prayer books, coplas, coplas is uh, um, kind of uh, um, popular literature in Ladino, for example, Coplas de Yosef Atzadik. Um, letters and other documents in Ladino in the Geniza collections, most of, of whom have, not, have, have yet, not yet been published. Some of these documents were recorded in catalogs only as unidentified texts, or even sometimes mistakenly Judeo-Arabic letters. I found some examples of this mistake. In addition to Ladino, there are a few letters in Yiddish and also some letters in European languages, such as Spanish and Italian, written in uh, Latin letters. 
European Jews adopted the, Aram the Arabic language by degrees. Although Turkish was also an important language, not only in Anatolia and the Balkans, but also in the Arab provinces of the Ottoman Empire, <coughs> it is very rare to find Turkish texts in the Guinea. Julia Krivorutko has published a short uh, text in Karamanli, Turkish written in Greek script, and I am planning to publish a unique uh, Turkish text in Hebrew script, shown here in the, in the right side of the slide, a Turkish Arabic glossary written by an Egyptian Jewish trader. It will be published in the next issue of Topika. The linguistic variety appears not only in one Geniza collection, but also sometimes in one Geniza fragment. A Sephardi immigrant in the 16th century used Ladino in his family circle, Arabic in the market or in the Khan, and Hebrew on other occasions. Here, for example, you can see Hebrew, it's Kiyash Mera Shabbat Elish Mereni, Piyut. Here, you can see text in Ladino, you see Mi cabeza, saber, como esto, bueno, yeah, it's Latino. And here, a glossary. And here, Arabic, salam ala ta'ala, text in Arabic. Um, but um, um, the three languages appeared side by side, not only on one fragment, but also sometimes on one sentence. For example, this is Hebrew letter from the 16th century, written by a woman to her mother-in-law. She used the Hebrew, Aramaic, and Latino. Waya senora tia, el sana ala di ta'alam tua perush, amelacha shel amaditi. So, uh, 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 I'm, I'm sorry that uh, Maria is there. Uh, Meira. Meira is not here to see this uh, switch code. Um, this linguistic variety reflects the diversity of Jewish society in that period. Thousands of immigrants from Spain, Portugal, Sicily, North Africa, Germany uh, assembled a new social mosaic in the Near East. Every group of immigrants founded its own framework called in Hebrew and in the Dino, Kahal, or Kal, in plural, Kihalim. Uh, it means different synagogue, different wakf, different leadership. While in the classic Kinesa, we know of two synagogues in Fustat, Kanisa Ben Erakim, or Kanisa Ashamim, and two others maybe in Cairo. In the Ottoman period, we find many synagogues in the city. Some of them are mentioned in this list, some other not, which was written in the 16th or 17th century. Um, look, you can see here the variety of culture. Kanis uh, Navar, yeah, this is probably a Sephardi synagogue. Two Magribian. Uh, synagogue. I, know, I don't know what is the word here, if you have um, you the suggestions, can you, it's two Maghrabi, uh, Mughrabi uh, synagogues, I, I don't know what is this one. Um, here you see Kanis Abu Shara. Abu Shara maybe uh, was founded by Jacob, Yaakov, Yaakub, Abu Shara, uh, which uh, he was a notable person in the Mustari community in Cairo in the end of the 15th century. Mustari is the, the native, the Arabic-speaking Jews. At the top of the list, you can see there is a mention Canis el Forasteros. Mm -hmm. Again, Arabic and Latin. Yeah. Canis el Forasteros, the synagogue of the strangers. Probably a synagogue founded by four young Jewish traders who settled in Cairo. Cairo became a Jewish melting pot. Uh, Jews of different regions met each other, did business with, with each other, uh, founded partnerships, and even sometimes married each other. Here is one example. In 1495, Aziza, daughter of Azar Bek, wrote a will. She was a Mustari or Mughrabi Jew, but her husband, Moshe, Yedia Falanzi came from Europe, probably from Spain. Falanzi is not from France. In that, in that, in that period, it, uh, um, it's a common uh, term in Arabic official documents uh, of this period to a newcomer from Western Europe, mainly the Safari. Uh, another example of intermarriage uh, between different Jewish groups, unfortunately, ended in divorce. 
1532, Abraham Castro, Abraham was one of the prominent Jews uh, in Egypt during the first half of the 16th century. He is the father of Rabbi Yaakov Castro, Maharikash. Um, he uh, divorced his fiancée, Hannah, in the court of Rabbi David Ben Zimba. Um, I, you know, uh, this uh, join, um, I found it uh, a few years ago in Cambridge, but now, um, thanks to the Friedberg uh, Geniza side, I can show you very, um, I can show the join, um, and I also celebrated it, uh, but they, they found it a new tradition to celebrate new joint in Facebook. Okay, um, Single point. No, no mind. Um, the name of the bride here, the bride father, was Naftali Ben Tzedaka. It's uh, difficult to read. Anu Bedin Chatumei Mata, Balefaneinu Kvod Rabbi Naftali Ben Kvod Arab Tzedaka. Uh, the name Tzedakah appears among Jews in the Muslim lands, but was not at all common among Sephardi or Ashkenazi Jews. It is clear, therefore, that the Sephardi leader, Ram Castro, married a Mustafa or Mughlavi woman. Local and immigrant Jews had many kinds of economic links. Loans, sales, transactions, and partnerships. For example, Judeo-Arab literature um, indicates a partnership between a Mustarib Jew and an Ashkenazi Jew. The writer asked, Ho Ovadia, please send regards to the dear fa uh, father, uh, the dear brother, Rabbi Yitzhak Prima, and kiss his hands for me and send regards to his partner, Rabbi Yaakov Ashkenazi. Um, may the Lord save him. Much peace. Yitzhak Fuhema is not a historic person from, from the Geniza and from the documents in the Cairo Community Archive. And, um, and this letter indicates a financial partnership between him and an Ashkenazi Jew, Jacob Ashkenazi. The multicultural society of the Egyptian uh, during the 16th and 17th centuries is wonderfully reflected in a deed written in Rashi, or Rosetta, in December 1557. Let's read the signature of the deed. The two um, <coughs> witnesses were Saadia Bulcher, yes, Saadia Bulcher, um, probably Madrigan Jew, and Abraham Hakan, probably Sephardi Jew. The three Dayanim were Moshe Binyamin, Eliakim Ashkenazi, and Ashkenazi, and Menachem Del Medigo, of the known Romagnotti family from Crete. In this deed, from a town on the Mediterranean shore, we see a microcosmos of the Jewish society of Egypt in the 16th century. Mugrabis, Mustaris, Romaniotes, the medical, Ashkenazi, and Sephardi Jews were cooperated together in the economic field in or, and in the court. And together constructed a complex Jewish mosaic. The document of the Ottoman period teach us that despite the different organizational frames, different kehalim, and various languages, diverse customs, the borders between the different Jewish groups were crossable, and various connections and links combined the different groups into one Jewish society. The study of the Geniza documents of the Ottoman period is still in its beginning stages. The glorious infrastructure, infrastructure that exists for the research of the classic Geniza does not exist related documents. Every Geniza researcher had heard or even used Goetain's laboratory. We heard about it from uh, where is it? Jessica. Uh, um, I remember myself, uh, I remember my disappointment when in the first step, steps of my PhD I went to the Institute of Micro, Microfilm, the Hebrew Manuscript in Jerusalem. Uh, I was excited but then I found that uh, I don't find uh, nothing relevant to my research. We don't have another such laboratory for the Geniza of the Mamluk and Ottoman periods. Neither do we have the corpora of published materials, like 
uh, the excellent volumes published from uh, Mann and uh, Schechter and Ginsburg to Goitain, Frankel, uh, Mark Cohen, Olsho Bischlanger, Elino Abarekit. We also don't have a wonderful tool like the Joshua Blau Judeo-Arabic Dictionary. The Arabic in the documents of the Ottoman period is not the same dialect as the dialect used in the document from the from earlier periods. Nevertheless, some important steps have been made in the last decades. Abraham David, Nahem uh, mentioned him, has published many letters, most of them in Hebrew, from the early Ottoman period. Some Judeo-Arabic letters from the Ottoman period were published by Joseph Khan and Maria Wagner, uh, but there is still an urgent need for the publication of a corpus of letters in Judeo-Arabic from this period. I hope to contribute my share for this effort in the future. Uh, I mentioned uh, Miriam and uh, Wagner. We are preparing now a corpus of documents, uh, most of them in Judeo-Arabic, some in Hebrew, uh, from the 15th century, all of them from the Bolivian. Uh, some literary genres of this period have been researched, researched recently. One of the most important sources of the history of the Ottoman Jews is the responsive literature of the Jewish stages of the empire. <coughs> In recent years, many responsive fragments from the Geniza have been published by Shmurin Glick and his research team. I, I work uh, uh, in this team. Zvika uh, Stamper work on the uh, volume of Moseri. Uh, another genre that has been analyzed deeply in the last years, mainly by Rachel Hasson, is popular literature. Uh, but uh, a huge amount of work still needs to be done. I find, I find hope for future research of the, what I call the Ottoman Geniza in the words of, of, one of one of the pioneers in the field of Geniza research, I mean to Yaakov Mann, Jacob Mann, who said, the task of examining the many thousands of fragments and extracting all the historical data they contain requires many years of labor and cannot be undertaken by one person. But how appropriate is the saying of the rabbis, the work, is, uh, the work is not for thee alone to finish, but thou art not free to desist from it. Yes, Maria. Wonderful work. You're a pioneer. May you develop a spreadsheet from which many of your students and their students can benefit. I think I have a reading for you for the word you couldn't read. Mm -hmm. Maybe they, um, because the it's uh, it's it's kinesian, kinesian, that's which is the dual, so, so it's no longer any dafa. I think they, I think it's you. It's they. Is that possible? What? Uh, I'm not sure. No. Okay. No, maybe, but I'm not sure. I understand the the, the reading. Okay. Oh, in Ladino. Ah, in Ladino. I don't think so. Okay. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for your brilliant lecture. I'd like to ask comparing a, to the to the old visa. I speak about the documentary visa. Would you say that in the new period most of the writings documentary are written by Egyptians, Jews? Uh, comparing to the situation in the old that you find from many other countries. It makes sense. Because, because the, 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 the realization was very, very um, uh, typical to Egyptian history. And <coughs> you, you have quoted the uh, Goitai, but Goitai made this great book, the Mediterranean Society, in yeah. order to to show how important it is to the general the, history. The, the name of Abraham David, please. Okay. So why you did it? No, no, but the point is, I, I asked you as one that read it, that maybe because of the political international situation that has been changed, and you put it per limitation, would you say, oh, it should be checked? If you can I, I don't make know. it in the collection of In the collection of documents, uh, I'm working with the uh, yeah, uh, many letters from Crete, from Sicily, from North Africa. So I don't know if I. So if, if it is the case, I, I, it's true that we, we don't have international trade uh, with India. Uh, it's more. Uh, I think it, 
one should take the challenge very uh, seriously, and because of that, you want, if, if this is the case, maybe one should think about another politicization, but this is only thinking in the beginning of the system. Okay, thank you. Questions? Nachem, did you have a question? You had your hand up. No. Okay. Yeah. Can I first? I I I always love to hear your paper because it is it really touch a, a new field in, in Geneva. And then this is what uh, I, I, I have to return to the title, a new periodization. I think what you prove is that there is a classical Geneva and there is a late Geneva because there are so many differences that the tools that you as a, as a researcher need in, in dealing with the not classical Geniza are completely different. So, so the period is... You mean linguistically? Uh, linguistically? Not Sorry. only, only it's historically, only uh, in, 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 in many ways. I mean, uh, I... It's not methodologi methodologically different. No, 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 methodologically, no, but, but you have to know a, a different, a, you have to be familiar with different history, <laughs> while in, in on the 9th century until the 13th century, you can deal it as as a, as a as a as a complete corpus. Bonus. So so the participation it is. I mean, even if you don't like it, there is class. Okay, not classical, but let's say old Gniza and new Gniza. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. This is fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> There was a question at the back, yes? Somebody had a question. And yes, Jessica, yeah. Yes, I did have a question, but it's a, a question that will reflect entirely on my ignorance. Um, and I know that you have done some surveying of the material. Um, in terms of letters, did you, do you find uh, a, a um, do you find that uh, the majority of them are in Judeo-Arabic still, or is there an equal number in Ladino? Is what what is the uh, language? Uh, uh, you know what the language uh, variation is? Yeah, it's an important question. As, uh, and as I said, we are in the beginning, very beginning, I think, uh, the stages. Uh, uh, it's the, pro the problem is, um, who is the writer? <laughs> Most Arab Jews wrote in Judeo-Arabic, Sephardi in Ladino, and it changed. Sephardi Jews uh, adopted the Judeo-Arabic in the 16th, 17th, 18th. It's a process. And sometimes they, they mix it, or uh, they they know uh, two languages, three languages. So it's very complicated. So we we can't speak on the corpus. We need to differentiate Jewish inner culture. So. Yes. Yes. Uh, I have a question. Uh, I suggest you, if I may, for you uh, about the term Ladino. As you know, Ladino is an adaptation of the term. Spanish term Latino, which is Latin language, I think is, is not correct at all, but no, it's a new point. This is a language containing the document is not Latin, but a variety of our Romance language. So it's better to use the term Judeo Romance according to the reference and registers to be the Iberian Peninsula. I know that the term is well used. Yeah, yeah, I know it's very complicated because every researcher you use on that. Some call it Ladino, uh, Espanol, Judesmo. David Bunis called it Judesmo, and then don't use the Ladino. So it's for us. I, I use the, the word Ladino. But, uh, I know, but Spanish didn't exist at that time. You know, this is the, the main problem for, for this level. And if you take a look at the Andalusian documents, you will see that terms like Latino and Luba Latinia, even Ajami. They both means Romans, to the Romans varieties. So uh, each community is using its own variety depending on the, uh, the Jewish authorities or the Jewish translator of the Jewish copies is working in Aragon, in Catalonia, in Andalusia, and so on. So you can differentiate between different languages. <coughs> yes, I think. Uh yeah, uh, did, you, did you mention the new Geniza that the Egyptians dug? No. 
in the 1980s. I have, but well, I mean, it's just, I mean, it hasn't been much studied because uh, they won't allow access, uh, and the uh, materials are all stashed away in Barrel Kutub. Um, but but the Egyptians published a little catalog called uh, Beniza al Gadida, and I wrote a little bit about it in Arabic. Well, but what's interesting there is that it represents and has the same kind of mix of materials that you find in Goitain's classical. And it's multi-linear because it covers a period from the late 19th century right up to the 1950s. And it represents the multilingualism of the Egyptian Jewry. And it's, uh, it'll take peace between Israel and Egypt for uh, any one uh, boss with the skills study that kind of material to get access to. So the Geniza has a very, very long durée. Yeah, no, it's a, I, I believe that there are many uh, late uh, fragments. Uh, and it's interesting that the, the balance between the old materials and the new materials, it's not the same in every collection. For example, if you find a uh, book the, the old series, that are like uh, Oriental 1080 in Cambridge, you won't find the late material, but in Mosseri or in the Gaster collection or in the uh, uh, Alliance in Paris, there are many late fragments. So from the 19th century, the line is disproportionate to the 19th century. Yeah. And somebody had a question. Yes, ma'am. Can you say anything about the Swedish. Yes. Mm -hmm. How many are they? Have they all been published already? Are they specific for the century? I mean, the uh, uh, most, most of them were published by Chabot uh, articles from uh, 1984. Uh, I found just uh, two or three uh, new letters. I gave them to my partner. And then Chabot was angry. Classical, so-called classical Geniza. 
but still, as Amir uh, sort of pointed out, there is a separation. I mean, there is something very different as happening. Uh, so the first question is, do you have an idea of what happened? You know, around 1250, around 1265, in the middle of the whole period. What happened in the Namaluk period to stop the... That one made the demographic change, and one that... Okay, that's one question. Okay. The other one, and this is maybe a marina type question, is um, for my very limited exposure to the so-called late Geniza, one of the things that I'm thinking about, I, I don't remember a lot of state documents. So um, does that... I, I mean, asked Marina this question. Uh, okay. uh, so so, so what is does this reason? show us that the Jews somehow, I mean, this would fit kind of like what we think about in the Mongol period, that the Jews lost their position mm -hmm. in the government or uh, that the government have stopped, uh, you know, doing whatever Marina was describing about producing paper and sending it around to the. Uh, okay, I, I'll let Marina to answer the, the second. But okay. For the first uh, question, um, first of all, we have to find where to, you know, to point the, the finger. Um, what is the and it's it's a process. It's not one point. But uh, Goitain wrote in the Mediterranean society that till 1265 you have letters from every year and then uh, um, I think that the, the main change is in the 14th century, maybe in the middle of the 14th century uh, and maybe it's demographically the, the Black Death and the, you know I think that from all the centuries in the Geniza the 14th is small. Yeah, small, yeah from the 15th we have Hundreds, thousands, I don't know the count. So maybe this demographically. So the move to Cairo and the Black Death. <laughs> yeah, maybe. So about, yeah, about the um, question of are there uh, state documents or other court documents, which is what starting the military is actually part of the state, but it's not in the policy period. Um, there are. So in the database that I have, um, without even looking at them, about 60 from the Mamluk and Ottoman period. Yes, we have them. Are these studies? I mean, there is a, I know that they might be still together, but there is a different well, explanation for why they are found if they are cut documents or state. This gets to the second part of the explanation. Um, it's different from the Mamluk period. Um, if you had asked anyone who had asked me, you know, what is the Mamluk period, 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 what is the Part of the reason that we don't think that these documents exist is that we're not trying to look at them because nobody's deciphered them because we don't know what they look like. So all it takes is somebody like Dutan to be able to actually recognize the documents and suddenly I think the statistics are going to change. Um, the other thing is there's always when one talks about the Mamluk period and the Ottoman period relative to the Fatima and Ayyubid, there's this narrative decline that has been kind of embedded in the literature like from the beginning. And so it's really easy for us to fall back on that as a theory, like did the Jews' position decline and that's why there are interstate documents. Um, and I think we have to be careful about that. Um, I think one of the reasons that these haven't been worked on as much as well is that a lot of the people who work on Mamluk and Ottoman history, the Geniza is not the first place that they're going to look for material um, because they have archives. Because if you go to Egyptian archives and if you go to the archives in Istanbul, you're going to find much more, um, as far as we know than what you find in the Geniza. This is obviously an important part of the story. It shouldn't be overlooked, so. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, to a, a rather more informal ending to this session, um, Moshe and Efrai suggested that I should make some personal uh, remarks in looking back at the conference and what I what I felt about